personally, I've always loved the Psalms um, because of their nature as poetry. Um, in, in case you don't know, uh, a psalm is a hymn or a song that is sung to God or is about God. Um, and it's really similar uh, to as if we were reading our worship songs and if we were just kind of analyzing that. Um, but to leave it at that uh, would be doing the psalms a disservice because it's so much more than that. Um, I'm, I'm a writer. I enjoy writing, um, especially things like, like poetry. Um, and... Uh, won me a lot of friends from growing up, you know, being a little boy that liked poetry. Um, but, um, you get, but in poetry, you get to express a wide variety of emotions and, and feelings. Um, and in a, but it's in a very structured, organized way. It's not, you're, not, you're not just haphazardly throwing some words together. Um, there, there's um, a beautiful structure in poetry. You don't randomly choose words, um, but you use and repeat words and phrases and ideas um, not just for literary balance, not just um, to make it sound uh, right or not just to rhyme, um, but to express the deepest feelings um, of your heart. The Psalms are powerful in that, in how they express emotions, and they sometimes kind of surprise you. Not every Psalm is about joy or talks about the grandeur or wonder or um, the marvelous works of God. Um, not every Psalm uh, boasts of God as our shepherd who watches us and guides us. Um, in fact, some of them sound a lot like the psalmist is shaking his fist at God. Uh, some of them sound sometimes like he's a bit angry or he's given up on God. Uh, and sometimes the psalm ends and there's not a resolution to it and it kind of leaves you hanging there. Um, the psalms, I think, especially appeal to us because we're not creatures with just two settings on our um, on our emotional dials, but we're people that have a wide variety, we're complex beings, the wide variety of feelings and emotions and experiences. And so in this, the Psalms, te the Psalms teach us that we can be completely honest with God um, uh, in a way that honors and glorifies God. Um, so incidentally, the, the Psalm that we're going to be looking at, or, or the hymn that we're going to be looking at this morning, um, is not an angry or bitter or distant um, Psalm. I'll, I'll save that for next time I speak. Um, but tonight we're going to look at uh, a hymn that explores the faithfulness of God. So um, any fans of the band U2 in here? Two of you guys. Great. Um, that's great. There's this is really small band out of Ireland. You might not have heard of them. Um, sold a couple of records. Um, but uh, they've been around for uh, about three or four decades. Um, back in 1983, um, they're, they're working on what was their, then their third album. Um, and uh, they had all their songs lined up, and then they couldn't, um, all they had left was their last song. And they couldn't find a song they thought would be good enough to kind of um, complete the album. Now, on an album, um, every song is, is important. I mean, that's why the artist puts it out on the album. But the last song just kind of has to have, you know, the right um, feeling or, or, or whatever to kind of, um, ended off, and they hadn't found a song like that, um, and uh, they had overbooked their time in the studio, um, and so the studio was about to kick them out, and so their bassist went home, went left, he's like, this is pointless, we'll figure something out, and so the other three remaining band members were left um, in, in the studio, and they were just kind of playing some music, and within 10 minutes, they penned the lyrics of a song. Um, the next 10 minutes, they, the three of them recorded it. Um, with the edge of the guitarist um, bouncing back and forth between the electric and the bass. And then in the same amount of time, another 10 minutes, they mixed it. In 30 minutes, they, um, they, they put a song together, and uh, they, they tacked it on to the end of that album, and they kind of hoped for the best, right? Um, that album, uh, which is called War, um, became a huge hit. Um, and, and here's how big it became. It knocked Michael Jackson's Thriller off the top of the charts. You know, Thriller, the, the, you know, the, the dance there that we know and the song that's, that's become so iconic, it knocked that off the charts. Um, and the little song that they had written and recorded and mixed within 30 minutes, you know, just to give the song uh, or to give the album a bit of closure, um, really struck a chord with listeners. Um, so much so that it became a staple uh, in their concerts. It, it became uh, a regular that they did every single time. Um, and as U2 kept getting bigger and bigger and began packing uh, football stadiums and large venues for their concerts, um, they'd, end their con they'd end their concerts with this little song. Um, and, and the crowd would continue to sing it. And the band would even leave the stage, and the crowd would keep singing the song um, 
for, for minutes and minutes uh, on end. Um, again, in, in, in the 30 years since they wrote the song, it's been a huge staple. Um, it, it was sung at almost every single one of their concerts. Um, the song wasn't, um, you know, a beautiful, it wasn't Beautiful Day, it wasn't uh, With or Without You or Where the Streets Have No Name, uh, wasn't Sunday Bloody Sunday or Vertigo or, you know, some of you guys are looking like I've never heard of these songs before in my life. Um, but, but these are some of their more, more popular hits, right? In the Name of Love, One, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For, is none of those. Um, it's just a song simply titled 40, and um, it's actually the song that we're going to be studying this morning. And so I bet, um, never thought you'd hear that from the stage, right? Tonight, or this morning, we're going to do an expository study of U2's rock hit, but um, that's actually what we're going to be doing. Um, I'm going to read the lyrics, and then I'll tell you where we're going with this, all right? Um, here are the lyrics. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit and out of the miry clay. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song. How long to sing this song? How long to sing this song? How long, how long, how long, how long to sing this song? You set my feet upon a rock, and you made my footsteps firm. Many will see, and many will see and hear. And I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song. How long to sing this song? How long to sing this song? How long, how long, how long, how long to sing this song? See, back when U2 was racking their minds and their talents and trying to figure out uh, a way to close this album, um, they were playing some music, and uh, the lead singer Bono, he opened up his Bible, and he found a psalm, and he started reading from it. Um, and uh, the lyrics are lifted right off the pages of the Bible. Um, in fact, uh, the title, uh, 40, is in reference to the psalm number. It is Psalm 40. It's a psalm written by David. Um, and the lyrics are uh, almost verbatim, the uh, words from the first three verses. And so this is the psalm that we'll be reading this morning. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to uh, Psalm chapter 40. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles with me, I, I believe the words should be up uh, behind me. And um, what we're going to do this morning, uh, if it's okay with you guys, if you guys would stand, and uh, we're going to uh, read... Uh, the words together. It's something that I used to do as a kid. I think a lot of churches still do. And uh, so we're going to read Psalm chapter 40, um, and we'll just, uh, you guys, free to read it out loud with me as I read it. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I'll proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. And then I said, Behold, I have come, and the scroll of the book is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha, aha, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. If you guys would bow your heads with me. 
If you guys would take a second, um, pray uh, silently to yourself. Pray uh, for yourselves um, that the words uh, that are spoken, and indeed the word of the Lord, uh, would speak to you, that the Holy Spirit uh, would uh, transform you. And now pray to the person to the left and to the right of you, that their ears would be opened uh, and that God would move uh, to reveal um, his faithfulness. Now take a second and say a quick prayer for me that the words that come out of my mouth may not just be my words, but may be words uh, that move uh, with the unction of the Holy Spirit. Father, I come before you this time, this morning, Lord, and I thank you that your word is alive and active, Lord God, um, from, from every book uh, which is written, Lord, even in the Psalms and in the poetry. Father, I pray um, that as you reveal to us, Lord God, that you are a faithful God, that you are a faithful Savior, um, that our hearts would be warmed and awakened, that our affections would um, would be drawn to you. Holy Spirit, um, work through my words and maybe even despite my words um, to work a change, Lord. Um, remind us of the greatness and faithfulness of our God. I do something that my words uh, and my intellect and my ability could never do on their own. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. You guys can grab a seat. Sometimes when uh, we're able to read a psalm, uh, and we know what the context of it, uh, uh, that it was written in, um, either by the situation or the psalmist will straight out come out and tell us, um, this is what I was going through, or this is the instance, um, and, uh, but, but sometimes we don't get that. Um, this isn't narrative, um, like a lot of the Old Testament or a lot of the Gospels are. It's, it's not a story, it's I'm writing out of my experience. I'm writing because of uh, these things that are welling up within me. Um, and so we really don't know what the psalmist is going through. The closest thing that he comes to that is he says, I was in a, um, the pit of destruction in a miry bog. Um, and we know that this is a literary device. Um, he wasn't really, uh, most probably, stuck in uh, a swamp or quicksand, um, but it's something that he uses to describe um, his situation. But I'm, I'm almost glad that he doesn't do that um, because a lot of times when we read uh, something, especially in the Bible, and we figure out what the context is, we try to apply it only, and we say, okay, well, this is only applicable, applicable in this context. Um, well, this is what happened, and so we can only do that. But um, without him tell, David directly telling us what's going on, um, it, it's sort of like an uh, umbrella. We can uh, almost apply it to different situations. Um, we don't have to limit our understanding or application to a specific instance. Um, and so whatever it is, um, odds are that if you're sitting in this room that we've found ourselves in a similar situation in the sense that we feel um, we're in a situation where it seems like all hope is lost. The psalmist is recounting a time when he was in um, a pretty bad predicament, um, and he's floundering. The imagery in verse 2 is, says, he drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog. It conjures up this image of the swamp or, or of uh, quicksand. Um, when I was young, um, one of my biggest fears, one of my uh, legitimate worries was that I would step into some quicksand and get stuck and die there. Um, don't ask me why. I'm not sure why, but that was like a legitimate fear I had. Um, I read somewhere um, that if you get stuck in quicksand, um, you're stuck. You can't get out. Um, and, uh, and then you're, you're pretty much a goner. And um, and I was just convinced that I was bound to step in one, you know, because there's so many quicksand pits in the suburbs of Dallas. Um, but in, and in fact, in the, what they say is if you're stuck in quicksand, the more you struggle, um, the faster you get stuck and the faster you get sucked in. Um, and that's the idea that's conveyed in this verse. The psalmist was in a dire situation with no hope. Um, and in fact, the harder that it seemed that he struggled, um, the worse off he was. Um, and notice that the help doesn't even come right away. He says, I waited patiently. He has to patiently wait. Now, you can imagine that if you're in that situation, um, patience is not the word that comes to your mind uh, if you're stuck in quicksand, um, right? Um, I'm, 
I don't think David would be saying, um, I'm stuck in this quicksand and I'm sinking down further and further, but it's okay, God, take your time. I've got all day. Um, actually, I've got about six minutes, but it's okay, take your time. Um, it's a patience that says, look, I'm in this situation and I need your help and I'm, I'm in a big mess, but I know that you will not let me down. It's a patience that trusts in God, that God will come through. And, and the psalm tells us he does. God hears. He lifts David up uh, from the quicksand that he couldn't save himself out of, and he puts him on a rock upon solid ground where he won't sink in and flounder. Um, but be careful that as you're reading this, you don't uh, begin to see, uh, don't begin to think of the situation as the focus of these verses. Um, the, the situation is not what, what David focuses upon. If, if you look at the verse, um, remember, he doesn't even tell us what the situation is. Um, but you can tell by the language that he uses what his focus is on. His main focus is to tell us what the Lord God did, right? He says, God heard David's cries. God drew David out from the pit of destruction. God set him on solid ground. God put a song, a, put a, in fact, a new song in his mouth. And the best part is that it's not just any song. It's a song of praise about God. Do you see the pattern here? Do you see a recurring motif? It's all about God. Where is David in all this? David is the weak, um, he, he, he's the passive agent, a passive person in need of help. God is the active agent. God is the one who does the saving. God is the one doing all the work. Um, all of David's effort to save himself is do no good. And the result is, many will see, and they will hear how God has saved you and put his song in you, and they will fear and, and, and they don't just believe that God is real or that he's able to save, but David says that they actually put their trust and their faith in the Lord. They see the Lord's saving arm, and they say, I'm with that. That is a, tr uh, a trustworthy, a faithful God. And they put their faith and their trust in the Lord. Now, what's so amazing about these three verses is that you have to remember who is writing this, right? Uh, this is King David, undoubtedly one of the greatest uh, warriors and heroes recorded in Scripture. And this is the same David uh, who goes out against Goliath, right, and kills him. He kills this one guy with, with, with one rock, and the women are all over him, right? It says as soon as he kills Goliath, right, he kills Goliath with, with a stone, with one rock, and chops off his head, and the women swarm the streets, and they start singing a song. And this is the song that they sing. They say, our King Saul, he's killed his thousands. But David, David's killed his ten thousands. It's, it's one of the most ironic things in all situations because David kills this one guy and all of a sudden he's raised to this, this folk legend. Um, it, it, it's incredibly ironic. Um, and David does go on to become a great warrior. Um, but if there's anyone uh, who, I mean, he single-handedly saves Israel uh, right for, from the Philistines in this situation. Um, in fact, he's going to do so over the course of uh, his reign as king, and he's going to save them from um, other enemies. And uh, he's usually the, later, uh, the leader that people can trust, right? David will save us. He'll get us out of this situation. And if there's anyone who could have had bragging rights um, about his trustworthiness, about his power, about his ability to save his people, to save those following him, it would be um, this David. And here you have the same King David singing that he gets in messes and the only one who can truly save him, the only one worthy to put his trust, the worthy for you to put your trust in is God. It says, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I'll proclaim and tell of them, yet there are more that could be told. And then we get to verses 6 through 8. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. And then I said, Behold, I've come, and the scroll of the book is written to me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. See, even during David's time, even during David's reign as king, they knew that what God delighted in, um, what, that even though God had appointed the sacrificial system, right, God's the one that put that in place, um, the sacrifices and the offerings weren't what um, it didn't terminate in on themselves. That's not what God was looking for. It wasn't the religious things that his people were doing that pleased or delighted God. Um, it's not what he was after. 
their hearts weren't into what they were doing, more often than not. Um, they didn't really care about the sacrifices. Um, they just wanted to appease God. And they thought, look, if I, if I can do all these right things, if I can do what he's commanded me to do, um, then God will somehow be pleased with us. Surely if I do this and this and this and I don't do this um, and I do this and I watch and I don't watch this and I give this much and I offer this much of my possessions and I read this much of the sacred scriptures um, this many times, then surely God will be pleased with me, right? And thank goodness we don't do any of that now. Um, but it, it's not what God delights in. Um, and so the question is then what does God delight in? If, if it's not what he has commanded them to do, then, then what is his delight in? And verses 7 through 8 tell us. Um, in fact, verse 8, it says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Um, remember how I said way back in the beginning that when, when you have poetry, you don't waste any words or you don't use words random. That, that word in verse 8, I delight to do your will, is the same exact same word as in verse 6 as it says God does not delight in just sacrifices. Um, it's, it's not just random how he uses it. It's the exact same word. God's, what God delights in is when we delight to do his will. Um, God's delight is not that we begrudgingly serve or worship him, but that we joyfully obey him. God's delight is in our delight, and we delight to do God's will when his law is within our hearts. It's the echoes of the promises that you find in Deuteronomy and, and said from the, uh, from the prophet Jeremiah when they speak of the law, the law not just being written on stones, not just being written down, but in fact written upon and impressed upon our hearts um, so that we know and we love and we cherish them. See, following religion will teach us that we need to do and obey because that's our duty. But the merciful, loving, saving God says, no, do and obey because you delight in doing so. You see, God is after your joy. God is after you delighting in him, not to, not to, not to suck your joy away um, as um, what we would call, call religion or even our culture would teach us, but for our joy to actually increase. And then we keep reading through verse 10, and you see that the overflow of this joy um, is, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I've spoken of your faithfulness uh, and your salvation. I'm not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. You can't contain the joy that is within you. Um, there's an overflow of thanksgiving and delight that ends up being proclamation of the salvation of God, of what he has done. Um, and not just what he has done, right? But in fact, how your joy has increased through him. He's sharing with everyone that he sees that the God who saved him from this, helpless, from this hopeless situation didn't just arbitrarily save him for no purpose, but also increased his joy and increased his delight. And this rubs against our Western sensibilities um, because they tell us that, that that's too much, right? Uh, you keep your faith and your beliefs and your experiences to yourself. Um, we don't want to know that. But David says, look, I can't keep it within me. Look, this is what God has done. God saved me from the brink of death. This is where I was. This is where I am right now. But not just has he saved me, he has increased my joy. I can't contain it in. This is life-changing news. I was brought back from the brink of death, and I'm changed because of it. It's not a keep it to yourself kind of news. And as you keep sharing what God has done in you and through you, the, the, the beautiful thing is that it keeps you humble. Because you're not allowed to take credit for something that only God could have done. And at this point, before we continue, I, I want to ask you, has there not been a time in your life where you've been in a situation, or a hopeless situation, where your only source of strength, of deliverance, was God? And, and, and to take a second to ponder that and, and think, how did you respond in light of that? Was it just brushing yourself off and saying, phew, I'm glad I'm out of that, let me keep going. Or was it anything like what David says in the first 10 verses? And if not, then why? We get to verse 11, and we get to a change in the course of Psalm. Because uh, up until now, David's been recounting something that's happened in the past, right? He's like, this is what happened, and this is how I responded in light of that. This is how God was faithful, and God pulled through, and how I, David, responded by having my trust in God and sharing the salvation of God to everyone in the assembly, to everyone I ran across. And we get to verse 11, and we find out that now this is the present, 
because now David has found himself in a new situation, a new instance of needing help from God. And, and listen, if you're alive, you're guaranteed to run into situations where, um, and, and more than one, where you find yourself in hopeless situations of needing help from God, of, of struggling. No one is exempt from that, this side of Jesus returning and reigning as conquering king of the universe. And we read and it says, I'm surrounded by enemies. You know, these are nasty people who are looking uh, to eagerly actually hurt him uh, and to gloat over him and to put him to shame. But you read it, and you see that he's actually plagued by two sources, okay? So, so there's very much a very, uh, the reality of physical danger coming towards him. But it's not just that. Verse 12 says, For evils have uh, surrounded me beyond numbers, but more so my iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They're more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. There are, are these physical threats, but there are even these spiritual and maybe even emotional uh, threats. And, and he's crippled. And even though just a few verses back, he was saying, look, I delight to do your will. But even now, he's in this place um, where he's racked with these internal struggles. Um, we're not sure if it's, if it's sins that he's currently struggling with or if it's the guilt of sins he's done. We know that David isn't exempt from these sins, but these sins are, 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 are ruining him. It's, and, uh, and he turns to the only source of help, uh, the only place that can help him in this situation. Um, and it's, it's one of the designs, uh, the, one of the brilliant, beautiful uh, designs of our sufferings. It's that's in our weakness and in our failings, God is shown to be strong and able. God is the one who lifts us up. And sadly, more often than not, these are often times, the only times maybe, that we turn to God, isn't it? It's when our backs are up against the wall, um, when there's no other way out, when we can't get out of our situation on our own. In his sovereignty, God allows us to walk through hardships and difficulties and walk through the valley of the shadow of death, not because he's unable to save us from doing so or unable to stop us from doing so, but because he's about making sure his name is glorified and because he is never not in control. Now, remember way back verses 1 through 3. God is the active agent in our salvation. Um, and deliverance. And the end result is that many people would see him and glorify him and praise him, and he would be made famous. And they would put their trust in him because he is completely trustworthy. Our sufferings and our trials are not without purpose in the hands of a sovereign God. All right, let, let me read that again. Whatever we're walking through, our sufferings and our trials are not without purpose in the hands of a sovereign God. But what is the psalmist counting on? We see that his previous experiences with the faithfulness of God, who has, who has saved him uh, from the past, provides him assurance that this same faithful God is going to save him in his current situation, in his current distress. Um, in all reality, verse 11 is where his real prayer takes off. Verses 1 through 10, um, he's praising God, but he's also reminding himself, look, this is what God has done in the past, and knowing this, I know that he can and will save me in my current uh, situation. And this is what he banks on. The unchanging God who cares about his people will come through again. Um, I haven't shared this uh, much uh, up here or m maybe even with a lot of you, but um, before I uh, begrudgingly answered the call to ministry, I was, um, uh, I was on a completely different career path. I was down at the University of Texas in Austin, um, I was a pre-med student, um, and things were going great. I mean, uh, I had good grades, um, I had good friends, my parents were proud of me that I was doing something that they could, you know, boast about, um, and, and everything seemed to be going well until um, God came along and kind of ruined that. You know, he kind of shook it up a little bit, um, and uh, he shook up my plans, and within a, literally a matter of months, um, my reality radically shifted. Um, Physically, um, spiritually, emotionally, financially, um, and, and even my relationships with, with some of the people closest to me. And, and without going into too much detail, I can honestly say that there are so many times where I thought I wouldn't make it. In fact, I thought I couldn't make it. Um, that I had waited in way too deep over my head. I was in a situation where um, I was just too far gone. Um, 
too far into the pool. And so many times where, I, where, where my back was pressed up against the wall and I had no other hope um, but to turn to God um, and to hope in the mercy and grace of God. I, I wasn't even sure that he would save me out of it. But all I could do was throw uh, myself upon his mercy. And time after time, and time after time, after time, after time, God pulled me out of the miry bog at the very last moment, proving his ability to save and even his willingness to do so. I, I don't have time to recount all the situations where he's shown himself uh, faithful to me, but um, I, I kept a prayer journal at the time, and I was looking through it recently. Um, this, is, this is a few years ago, and so many times I, I wrote these lines uh, in my prayer journal um, to remind myself um, of who I was dealing with. Um, and I wrote these words. I said, God, who is faithful, hasn't let me down yet. So what makes me think he's about to start now? Um, and, and it's something that I would encourage myself with, to remind myself, look, God has pulled through in the past. Um, why would he stop right now? And it's the same thing that the psalmist is doing here. He's reminding himself that God will come through again. But if all we had, okay, if all we had was our past experiences, what God has done in the past, um, and how he's delivered us in the past to give us hope in our present situation, what guarantee is there that we'd be delivered again? If, if all we have is, look, this is what God did in the past, is there a guarantee that he's going to do it now? What assurance do we have that God will continue to lift us up out of the pits of destruction we find ourselves in? Because besides our conjecture, do we really know that God loves us and will continue to be faithful in delivering us? How do we know that one day we won't fall into the mercy of God, but onto his impatient wrath as he allows us to suffer the consequences of our actions, or maybe even the actions of others? How do we know that he's completely trustworthy? I'll tell, you know, I'll tell you how we know that. How we know that God is faithful and trustworthy and loves us. Um, and it's simply because of Jesus. Um, you may think that, 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 that that's, that's the easy answer out, but I'll, I'll explain why. It's because God the Father sent his only begotten son to live with and among people who never fully appreciate him, never fully get him. And Jesus would live the perfect life that all of us are required to do but never do, and he still ends up suffering unjustly He's to the very point that he loses his life. Right? You, know, you know those verses that we read earlier um, here in Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8? The author of Hebrews says that Jesus quotes these very lines when he says um, uh, very words because, our, because he knows that our offerings and our sufferings and our sacrifices and our best efforts couldn't save us. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 4, reads, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written in me in the scroll of this book. See, Jesus Christ came down to do the will of his Father, which was to be our sacrifice for our sins. Um, but death did not uh, defeat him because we know that in three days later, he rose uh, from the dead as he said he would. And in that feat, he lifted us up out of the miry pit that we were, struck, uh, it, that we were stuck in of our sins and iniquities and the guilt of our sins and set our feet upon the firm rock and put a new song of praise in our mouths about him and, the save, and his saving work. This same Jesus went up into heaven, but he promises he's going to come back again as a blazing king, and all will see and recognize him for who he is. Church, that is how we know for certain, without a shadow of doubt, that God loves us and is for us and for our good. He didn't have to send Jesus, who, by the way, is a part of the Trinity, who is God. But the Father showed us his faithfulness in sending Jesus. And, and that is why we can fully trust him. That is why we can boldly and relentlessly pray uh, in confidence in our moments and seasons of distress. Because of Jesus, we can actually patiently wait on the Lord because we know that God will come through. Not just he might, but he will because God has delivered us uh, in Jesus. You can wait patiently as the psalmist did 
in verse 1, when you know that help is coming, if you ever doubt the goodness of God, if you ever have any doubts that God loves you, simply look to, to Jesus and what God did through him. You have no better picture of the extent and overwhelming amount of love outside of the crucified and risen Christ. That same passage in Hebrew um, reminds us that we, if we're in Christ, the Holy Spirit now uh, is in us. And in fact, he has put the law on our hearts and writes them on our minds so that our delight is to do the will of God. And this morning, if you're in Christ, you rest on that promise. If you aren't in him, if your faith and trust is in Christ, he offers you to come and follow him. Look, the Christian life was never promised to be without hardships. If, if, if anyone ever told you that, they lied to you. The Christian life was never promised to be without hardships or trials. However, we are promised a faithful God who saves. A God who saved through his son Jesus, cares about even our physical needs, and he will save. This morning, we get to celebrate uh, that reality um, in, in the taking of communion. And in the taking of communion, we celebrate what God has done in the person of Jesus Christ, in saving us, in bringing us out of the pit. That he who has saved us from our sins and from ourselves is willing to uh, save us even now in whatever hardships we find ourselves in. The way we do uh, communion here at Loft is this, the band's going to be, or um, being, is going to be sing a song, and as you pray in your seats, uh, reflect upon what he has done and what that means, um, how he is a God who saves. And as you feel led to, you can go up and grab the bread and juice um, they come in a little packet. We'll go back to your seats and uh, we'll take them together and we'll celebrate the God who saves. Father, I thank you, Lord, for what you have done in Jesus, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that you are a God who cares and loves for us, Lord, or who cares and loves us. And despite our brokenness, despite our messes, Lord God, despite the fact that we seem to be st- get stuck in quicksand over and over and over again. Lord, you are a God who is quick to save. Maybe not always quick in our, time, in our timings, Lord, but you do save, Lord. And Lord God, you showed us this most vividly in the way you sent Jesus to save us, Lord God, when we couldn't save ourselves from the bog and the pit and the, the destruction of our own sins and iniquities. When we couldn't save ourselves, when we were sinking even faster in, Jesus came and reached down and pulled us up and put us upon the solid rock. God, that, that, is, our only, that is our only boast, that you have saved us, and that you continue to save us.